Shalom, brothers and sisters, and welcome to this week's Sabbath service. We are going to start by reading scripture. This week we'll be reading Mark chapter 16, verse 15. And Jesus said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. For prayer requests this week, we had a brother that was electrocuted, so if you could please pray for him. We have some other people that are sick, and some people that are going through some afflictions, some hard times, where they are struggling with their faith. So please pray for these brothers and sisters. And as always, please pray for the unity of the saints, that we will be able to be one in Christ. If you'd like to pause the video now to say a opening prayer where you are and sing a hymn, please do so now. We will now proceed with the unity portion of the service where we will be reading the Shema. I'm going to read it in Hebrew and then I'm going to read it again in English and then we'll pause so that all those that wish to read it out loud so that we can be one in Christ in reading the Shema may do so. Shema Yisrael, Yiva Elohenu, Yiva Echad. Hear, O Israel, Yiva is our Elohim, Yiva is unity. For today's message, I felt very impressed by the Spirit to talk about Mark 16, 15 and 16. And Jesus said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He, and I'll add here, she, he and she, he and she that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he and she that believeth not shall be damned. Now, the Lord prompted me to speak about this earlier this week, and my immediate thought was, we're not an evangelical movement. Growing up in a very evangelical community, this was a very common scripture. Everyone's a sinner, and if you don't believe, you're going to hell. But is that really what this scripture is referring to? Is that really what this means? Regardless, there's still that evangelical message of preach the gospel to every creature. And I was thinking about that. You know, does that mean we need to be going out on the street corner and trying to convert people to the Church of Jesus Christ and Christian Fellowship? No, of course not. We're an ecumenical movement. We're a church to those that are spiritually homeless, to those that don't really have any place else to worship or others to worship with. But really, the point of the fellowship is we're seed planters. We want those from other Latter-day Saints to come in, worship with us, share their version, their understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the Latter-day Saint movement. And we want them to learn from the other branches of the faith. And then we want them to go back to their churches and plant those seeds and say, hey, you know, we're all Latter-day Saints here. We can all worship together as one in Christ. We want to get rid of that one true church mentality, just like Moroni, I'm sorry, just like Mormon did in the book of Moroni, chapter 7 where he talks about we can't war as fellow Christians because if you have the spirit of Christ and you're teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ even if you belong to a different church we shouldn't be condemning each other so I really had to think about this and I had to pray on it I really had to feel the spirit out trying to figure out what is it I'm supposed to say about these scriptures and a couple things came to mind and I want to break this down and go over them with you so First off, these are the words of Jesus Christ. It's Jesus that's saying them, and so therefore, we really need to take them to heart, and we need to break down and look for the deeper meaning of what he's saying, because Jesus always spoke in parables, and whatever he said, he always said it in something that could be understood in layers. And as we learn more through the Holy Spirit, a very simple sentence or a very simple expression can be redefined and re-understood over and over again in many different ways. It's, it's one of the amazing things, the way that Jesus taught. So first off, it says, go ye into all the world. 
I know a lot of people think that means okay, we got to, like I said, we got to go out to the streets, we got to knock on doors, we got to stand on street corners, we've got to go to other countries, whatever it is, go to all the world, and so that we can preach this gospel, right? Well, let's look at it a different way. We as Christians, we don't go and hide in caves. We don't become monks. We don't we don't live in you know tight knit communities where we we hide the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? We, we, we are a light that's supposed to stand out on a hill. So let's look at this as go you into all the world as you're going to go out and you're going to live your life wherever you go. Maybe the whole world, all, all of the world, isn't literally the planet Earth. It's everywhere you go. It's everything that you do. So basically, it's, another way of saying this is go out and live your life. And no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing. Now, I'm not saying that we don't need to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. Because I, I do feel that as Christians, it is our duty to share the gospel. But because I'm a Mormon Kabbalist, my idea of how we do that is much different to the way the evangelical Latter-day Saints or other evangelical Christians would view this. And that is really reflected in the next line. And preach the gospel to every creature. Every creature. It doesn't say to every man. It doesn't say to every man and woman. It doesn't say to every person or every people. It says every creature. Well, this kind of reflects back into the idea of going to all the world being, you know, an expression of, of living our lives wherever we go. Because... In Mormon Kabbalah, we preach the gospel by letting the light of Christ shine forth from us. It's, it's not a list of things to do, but more who we are on the inside. We've come to Christ with a broken heart and contrite spirit, and that's transformed us. We've been born again. And now that light of Christ shines forth from us and lights up the entire world. And that is sharing the gospel with every creature. So I think these two ideas here go hand in hand. Go out and live your life. And as you're living your life, live your best life. Live a Christ-like life. Let that light of Christ shine forth from you to light the rest of the world. That's how we preach the gospel. And I'll tell you, it's a lot more effective. Growing up in an evangelical Latter-day Saint church, Anytime I had an opportunity to, I'd be like, hey, look at those clouds. You know, those clouds really remind me of a scripture in Alma. And next thing you know, I'm basically preaching at them. I'm trying to convert them to the church I belong to. That's not Mormon Kabbalah. And in my mind, it's not even really Mormonism. What we want to do is express ourselves in such a way that people come to us they're moved by the Holy Spirit to say, hey, you seem like a, like a godly person. Do I, I, you mind if I ask you a couple of questions? And I'll tell you, people are going to be more receptive if they come to you than if you go to them. I learned this years and years and years ago. I remember where I, I had one job in particular. There were a lot of people there that were religious. They would find out that I was a Latter-day Saint, that I was Mormon, and they would they would watch me and they would study me. And because of the fact that I was in a managerial position, I I really couldn't go around preaching the gospel in an evangelical way, even if I wanted to. But I would have people that say, hey Dave, can uh, can we do lunch today? Oh yeah, sure, absolutely, let's do it. We go out to lunch and they sit down and they say, Hey, look, um I've noticed that there's something different about you it's like there's this light that comes forth like like you really you really get god and i've talked to some other people about it and they say you really know the scriptures can i, can I ask you a couple of questions and next thing you know we're having a very wonderful religious conversation and the thing that i quickly learned after i started noticing this happening was that the Holy Spirit left the moment I tried to use that as an opportunity to convert them to the church I belong to. And so because of that, I began listening to the Holy Spirit and just helping them 
get to know God a little bit better. And at first I thought, if I do it this way, then eventually they'll join my church. But they didn't. None of them ever did. And I got very depressed over it. And finally, I was praying it one day and the Lord said, they're closer to me. That's where they belong. And I realized and had to recognize that that was what the Lord wanted. Now, please understand, I am not sharing this with you to try to tell you what a great missionary I am because I am very, <laughs> I'm an introvert. I'm great at planting seeds and I'm great at, you know, living my life, I guess. But I, I'm, I'm not a salesman. So I was never very good at being able to give, convert people to anything. That said, the one thing that the Lord has blessed me with is a gift and ability to help people grow their relationship closer to God. And I'm telling you this because I'm hoping that by saying this, the Holy Spirit will speak to you through me and you'll hear a message on how you can do this in your own way, how you can feel and listen to the Holy Spirit and help people grow closer to God. And I'm hoping that you can avoid the mistakes that I made when I was doing this. Because I've been doing it my whole life. I started doing it as a kid in school. And it took decades before I woke up to the fact that I wasn't a failure as a missionary. Because I wasn't converting people to the church I belonged to. So please don't think that this idea of going out into the world and preaching the gospel to every creature means that you have to convert people to whatever church you belong to or the Christian fellowship or anything else, even Christianity. Because God's will will be done in all instances. And we can't convert anyone. But we can go out into the world and we can live our best lives and we can shine the light of Christ from us or through us and those that see the light will receive it. And as John 1, 1 through 5 says, that those who don't see the light, they don't recognize the light, it'll just be darkness to them. They won't be able to comprehend it. So the idea here, we go out into the world, we live our lives, we preach the gospel to every creature, we let the light of Christ shine forth from us so that every man, woman, child, cat, dog, plant, the earth, everything, feels that love of God so the creation can be healed. Not by our words, not really even by our actions, but by the Holy Spirit and the light of Christ flowing out from us, which influences our words and actions. Then in verse 16, it says that those that believe and are baptized shall be saved. So here we are. We're at salvation. And as you know, this is the... Some are saved, some are damned, right? So let's start off by talking about those that are saved. In 3rd Nephi, Jesus says that the Lamanites were converted, that the Holy Ghost fell upon them, but they knew it not. In our constitution, we say that the first principles of the gospel are faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and then repentance. Now, I believe that the first baptism is being born again. We're washed by that spiritual water. The spiritual light of Christ flows over us and transforms us into something new. And in Mormon Kabbalah, what that means is our perspective changes, our understanding, our, our view of life changes. And that changes our way of life. Because when your, excuse me, when your perspective when your perspective changes, all of reality changes with it. So, how are we saved? What are we saved from? Are we saved from the fiery pits of hell? We're saved from our pride, our egoism, the lies that we tell ourselves about how great or terrible we are. We're washed clean in the light of Christ. And we understand that the gospel is a new perspective, a new way of seeing things where we understand that all we really want is for God's will to be done because he knows everything. 
He's the creator. And so therefore, everything that comes from him is good. So we abandon the worldliness and these ideas of evil. And we realize that everything does in fact happen for a reason. And that does mean that suffering is going to happen. That does mean that bad things are going to happen. And God isn't going to cradle us and protect us from everything. But he can help us through it. He can help us survive it. He can help us move past it. And then with that light shining from us, we in turn help others through their trials. Sometimes by sharing our experiences, sometimes just being there with them, sometimes by walking away and letting people that need to be alone be alone. But we're able to do it because we're moved by the Holy Spirit to know what to do. Like when Ammon was talking to King Lamoni, the king didn't know what to say, but the Lord told Ammon what to say because God knows everything. God will do the same thing with us. Sometimes what that thing to say is nothing, it's silence. But the Holy Spirit will let us know. And in that sense, we are saved. What greater salvation can come than to see things as they are and accept them? To live in love, love of ourselves, of our fellow man, of all living creatures, of the earth, of the creation itself, to see the joy and the blessings that God has bestowed upon all of us. That, to me, is true salvation. You can send someone to the fiery depths of hell. If they have the love of God in them, it will be a paradise in their perspective. Likewise, you can send the worst demon to the greatest portions of heaven and it will be torture and torment to them because it's all about perspective. And that takes us right in to the final part of this. But they that believeth not shall be damned. What does that mean? What is damnation? Why will they be damned? Are they truly damned? Now, I personally do not believe that God just goes around cursing people, damning people. Jesus said repeatedly that he didn't come to destroy the earth, but to save it. He didn't come to condemn, but to heal and to save. So, if we believe not, that means our perspective is still one of worldliness. And I've said before, that the problem with egoism is that it's this hungry monster that can never be full. I always think of a dragon hoarding gold. If someone takes even one piece away, the dragon roars, goes out and destroys villages. And any more gold and jewels he can get, just grabs them and takes them for himself. It's this greed. I don't mean that to say that all dragons are bad. I'm not trying to badmouth dragons here. But in, in The Hobbit and other various medias, this, this is one way that people portray dragons. So if you're a dragon fan, I apologize. There are also very wise dragons in some, some myths and legends. So, you know, we're talking about the, the bad guy dragons here. But that's the way our egoism is. It can never be full. As the cup fills, instead of flowing over the blessings to bless others, the cup just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. The only thing that can fill our cups is Jesus Christ, that light of Christ. And then we can have the smallest cup. Maybe only holds one drop. But that drop will overflow exponentially because that's the power of Jesus Christ in the atonement. So what then is damnation? Is it just a perspective? A 
imagine that... Well, I, I'm going to share a story with you. This is a true story. One time, my grandparents, who are... I'll say agnostic. They're, they passed away now, but so I guess they were agnostic. They were out hiking with one of my cousins. My cousin was very young and I guess she attended a Protestant church and they were hiking in the woods and lost their car keys. They retraced their steps. They looked everywhere. They found, they found nothing. And they're pretty stressed out because this was before cell phones. They weren't really sure what they were going to do. And as they were walking, my cousin said, why don't we kneel here and we'll, we'll say a prayer to God and ask him to show us where the keys are. And my grandparents, you know, they, they didn't want to disrespect her family's beliefs. And so they did. They knelt down and bowed their heads. And they said a prayer. And when they opened their eyes, my grandmother says they were in a, a bit of a circle, the three of them. And when they opened their eyes right there in the middle of a circle were those car keys. My grandmother's response was, well, if there is a God, then God answers the prayers of children because they're innocent. My grandfather said, I think she had the keys the whole time. I think she put them there. And in my mind, I remember hearing the story and thinking, those are two very, very depressing ideas. Because one is of blatant mistrust. And he was being, you know, kind of funny when he said it. He was laughing about it. But at the same time, I, I felt like, you know, he was incredibly skeptical of the idea that God had a hand in it. But my grandmother's comment was even more depressing. Because that's to say that there is a God... But God doesn't listen to us. Got to listen to children because they're still they're still naive, they're still innocent. But God doesn't really listen to the rest of us. And I remember hearing that story and thinking that this perspective, this idea, is damnation because we can't see the miracle of God in our lives. Maybe it was the power of the three of them praying together, not just a child. Maybe it really was this child being moved by the Holy Spirit and not just her holding the keys and tossing them in the middle of them while their heads were bowed. If we walk the earth only seeing the worst of everything, that is damnation because we can't see the good news. Because that's what gospel means. It's Greek. It means good news. And by that, I don't just mean the good news of Jesus Christ. I mean any good news. I used to know a man. He was so rich. So incredibly rich. And he was constantly making money. He had millions and millions of dollars. Just, I mean, he had millions of dollars in investments, millions of dollars in his bank account. And I remember one day he got really excited because there was this deal where he, if he sold something, he was going to get a million dollars. And I was like, well, what, what's another million dollars with all the other million dollars that you have? I mean, it's nice, I guess, but I wouldn't be getting so excited about it. You know, if I have $100,000 and someone gives me 10 bucks, it's nice, I guess, but I didn't really need that extra $10, right? And then when he didn't get it, he was so depressed, didn't understand the human condition. Why are things the way that they are? He couldn't see the blessings the Lord provided to him through all the other wealth that he had. He only saw what he lost. And that to me is the definition of damnation. It's important that we have the right perspective because that's what I believe this verse 16 is really about. 
Where are our hearts? Where are our minds? What influences what we see? How we see? How we interact with what we see? If we are saved, we will see God in everything. But if we don't believe in good news, if we don't believe, then the damnation isn't hellfire necessarily, but rather the darkness that we have decided to dwell in. It's that dirty cup that can never taste the clean water because all you taste is the dirt in the cup. You're not washing it. It's the blindfold that we wear while standing in the middle of a sunlit field. And you want to scream to these people, wake up, look around you. Look at how amazing everything is. Now, I know some people will say, well, part of it, too, is this idea that cause and effect, if you do something bad, something bad is going to happen to you. But I like to be careful with that because there are people who do bad things and they don't get their comeuppance. Their consequences are not readily visible in a way that we will recognize. It's that age old question of why do bad things happen to good people and why do good things happen to bad people? And my response is always the same. Good and bad happen to all of us. What matters is what we see. And we have to keep in mind that the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. If the Lord blessed me with wealth, but then in that wealth, I can't see my family anymore. All I see are people trying to get my stuff. Is that a blessing or a curse? Because in my mind, it's a curse. I've been damned to worry more about keeping what I have from this world, the world that we we're told to go out and live in, than recognizing the true blessings and the true gifts that God has bestowed upon me, my friends and my family. We can't take our wealth with us, but hopefully, we can see our loved ones eternally. So my message for you today is go forth, preach the gospel. And what I mean when I say that is live your life, live the gospel. And because you are converted, your light will draw others to Christ. Remember, God has not called us to be hermits, but candles at the top of a hill. We're to be lighthouses. We don't need to go out into the ocean and grab ships and bring them in. But we need to be a light standing firm in place so that others know where the shore is. That's my challenge to you. That's my message for you. And I'll leave it with you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. We are now going to partake of the Sacrament of Communion. I'm going to play a pre-recorded statement on the sacrament. And then Christine is going to read the sacrament prayers. After which time you may pause the video to partake of the sacrament and then take a moment to ponder the atonement of Jesus Christ. At this time, we welcome all present to Christ's table. We invite all who would participate to do so as an expression of the peace and love of Jesus Christ, in whose name we worship. The Lord's Supper is a sacrament, a time to focus on the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As disciples of Christ, we renew our covenants and recommit together to his mission to grow closer to Jesus Christ as individuals and as a community, worshiping Jesus Christ through God's word, the sacrament, 
ministry, outreach, Kabbalah, and Jubilee. We encourage all that are worthy to receive communion to do so frequently and devoutly. O oh God, the Eternal Father, we ask Thee, in the name of Thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread to the souls of all those who partake of it, that they may eat in remembrance of the body of Thy Son, and witness unto Thee, O God, the Eternal Father, that they are willing to take upon them the name of Thy Son, and always remember Him, and keep His commandments which He hath given them, that they may always have His Spirit to be with them. Amen. O oh God, the Eternal Father, we ask thee in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this wine to the souls of all those who drink of it, that they may do so in remembrance of the blood of thy son, which was shed for them, that they may witness unto thee, O God, the eternal father, that they do always remember him, that they may have his spirit to be with them. Amen. Thank you for being with us today, worshiping with us today, whatever day it is that you're able to worship with us. If this video has helped you in any way, we do ask that you please share it with others, that this light can be a beacon of hope to others out there in social media, through email, or whatever way that we're able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ through technology so that those that are seeking may find. We are now going to say our closing prayer. Elohim Shaddai, we thank you for all of your many blessings. We thank you for the opportunity you've blessed us with to share in your gospel, to learn more about thee, to speak spirit to spirit and to hear spirit to spirit, we ask that you please bless us that we will more appreciate the blessings you provided for us, that we will see your hand in our lives and the love that you have for us, your creation. We ask that we can better represent you by allowing the light of Christ to shine from us into the world, to help heal the creation, to help convert others to gospel, not by preaching at them or to them, but by just living our lives, and letting them feel that spirit, so that like the warmth of a fire in a cold winter day, they will come into the light as moved by the Holy Spirit, and then grow in the grace of Jesus Christ as they build a personal relationship with you. We thank you for all of your blessings and this opportunity we've had to come together and worship and the technology you provided that allows us to do so. Again, we thank you for all your blessings and we pray these things to you humbly. In the name of thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ, so mote it be. Amen.